welcome to everyone who's attending today. It might be good evening, it might be good afternoon, or indeed good morning, depending upon where in the world you're tuning in from. So welcome to the summer program of the I3 lecture series. I'm really delighted to have Diane Mayer here today, um, who will be giving, I'm sure, a really wonderful presentation of her work. So I'd like to begin firstly by introducing Diane. So Diane Mayer is an artist working primarily with photography and more specifically with the combining of photographic imagery with hand sewn thread. Her use of cross stitching directly into photographs is a well established and recognized part of her art practice in which she has been active for some 15 plus years. Her work is appropriately recognized for being a significant contribution not only to an established history of the use of thread to alter a photograph both physically and conceptually, but also as an artist whose practice is key to contemporary concerns with photography's materiality. Diane is an alumni of the New York University Tisch School of the Arts and gained her MFA from the University of California in San Diego. She continues to live and work in California where she is also a professor of the Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Diane Mayer's artworks have been exhibited widely, both here in the United States and internationally. Notably, her work was included in the 2016 exhibition, A Matter of Memory, Photography as Object in the Digital Age at the George Eastman Museum and included in the accompanying publication of the same name. In the fall of 2019, the complete series of 43 images from the Berlin Project was exhibited for the first time in its entirety at the Klompching Gallery, coinciding with the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which as many of you will know, was in 1989. This followed with a selection of her artworks being curated into the Design Without Borders exhibition part of an important European-wide celebration of design. Originally, it was due to tour Europe, visiting venues in Budapest, Bratislava, and Vienna. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic meant that the exhibition pivoted to online and was only a virtual experience. Her work has been featured in a number of books, most recently, The Art of Collage, uh, published by Gestalten Books in Berlin. Finally, amongst Diane's many accomplishments is the inclusion of her artworks in numerous private and public collections, including the George Eastman Museum, the University of Maryland, the Contem Museum of Contemporary Photography and the Hood Museum, among others. Diane, I'm so pleased to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for joining us as part of this I3 lecture series, and I will now hand over to you. Thank you, thank you, Deborah, for such a, a nice introduction. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to Tom Ash, the chair of the department at, at, of, um, of the Masters of Digital Photography program at, at SBA. And thank you to everyone who, who's come to see the show. And, and also thank you, um, Marco, for, for all of your assistance through the process. So I want to start off even just going back a little bit and, and showing um, some work from, from the very beginning. I think giving a presentation about your work kind of gives you the opportunity to go back and look through the things that you've done and, and try to make sense of it all together and, and to um, realize that even projects that on the surface don't uh, have very much to do with one another um, are actually connected somehow. And I think that my earlier work, um, you would, without my earlier work, um, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. It all kind of um, leads up to it. And so um, in looking at my work, one theme that that has run through my work um, throughout the time that I've been working with photography has been just um, using my artwork and using um, photography in particular to understand a place and to think about how um, uh, the, just the physical, social, psychological qualities that characterize different places. And these investigations into place have taken different forms, uh, even different genres, even different mediums. 
um, just as each place is different, the um, work is has been um, different, has changed just in accordance with the conceptual framework of the project or the place that, that um, I was exploring. And so I'm just gonna start with my very, very first uh, photograph ever. Um, and this came about when I was four. Um, and I first learned about the both the evidentiary and, and in depth school nature of photography um, the hard way when my brother set his new um, Polaroid camera up on a tripod and told me not to touch it. And then came up to me and said, did you touch my camera? And I said, no. And then he um, presented me with this, this Polaroid of, of, of my face as I um, uh, took my, my first picture. And my, um, I had my next brush with photography was was sort of equally disastrous. Um, when in ninth grade, I went on a school field trip to Europe, and on the first day, dropped my point and shoot camera, and then came home and developed all uh, twelve rolls of film, which all sort of looked like this, um, basically reducing the trip to just an impression impressionistic blur, both in in my memory and in the photographs. And so I next. Um, in uh, college, I, I took a photography class really just as a general education requirement. I was living in New Jersey at the time, which is where I grew up. And I really just used the camera to explore my um, hometown and the, er the part of rural New Jersey where I grew up. So I was going to um, county fairs, diners, truck stops, places like that. Um, using the camera as kind of a, as Diane Arvis talked about, a, a passport to interact with people to um, as an excuse to kind of go places and and um, and interact with um, with people in, in different environments and so I, I was really interested in using the camera as a way of exploring um, place and kind of coming to terms with this place that I grew up in and so I then um, switched my major to photography and I. Uh, transferred to NYU um, to school to school of the arts where I ultimately received my BFA and at the time I didn't really know what I wanted to do in photography I assumed that I should do something practical maybe like for photojournalist um, photojournalism or editorial photography or commercial photography or something practical but then I had the um, good fortune of, of working with my teacher and mentor Larry Novak and she made me uh, understand for the first time that um, that I could pursue photography just to, as fine art. And, um, and and so I started thinking about um, uh, the photograph of, of kind of constructing realities and um, thinking about it not just as a two-dimensional medium. And so my thesis project kind of took this form of um, this invented character that also was exploring place and exploring um, my hometown. Um, and it was an installation that I created in the actual photo department there. Um, but the images became these kind of two dimensional objects that were part of this installation. And so it made me feel, um, think about the idea that a photograph is not merely just a two dimensional, but can be a three or even um, four dimensional um, process. And, and in my senior year at NYU, I was sitting in class and realized that all of a sudden with uh, a sense of panic that um, I would, after I graduated, that there would be no more critiques, that I didn't know who I would talk to about photography. And so I decided to apply to an MFA program. And, and so I applied to the University of California, San Diego, and um, I didn't uh, visit it first uh, at that time, and, and it possibly it's still like this, but all graduate stu students were fully funded. So I figured if I didn't like it, I could just um, uh, leave. But um, so I went to San Diego when I started school for the first time, and I, I drove there and kind of drove through the desert. And as someone growing up and, and ha who had always lived in the Northeast, um, the desert was, uh, it, it was a very awe-inspiring and also just um, a, a completely new and unfamiliar geographic surrounding. And that ex and so that led me to thinking about the West and, and, um, and the next body of work that I created centered around these explorations of the West. I was really interested in, in just the quality of light, 
um, the sense of scale in the desert, which made it hard to tell how near or far something was, the, the quietness of it. And particularly, I became interested in the relationship between the, the, um, the mythological West and the geographic West and, and the very large gap between the two. And so um, I created a series of, of pieces that explored um, the American West and, uh, and specifically the, this idea of, of how the mythology of the West is created and, um, and especially how um, it's perpetuated in popular culture and the history of painting and, and literature. Um, so the first uh, piece that you would uh, walk into when you walked in the gallery, there were these two facing monitors and one side had clips from different Western films and the other side had um, me um, interacting with it. So I uh, filmed myself in a similar location. So I was sort of interacting with the characters in the film. And when you walked into the gallery, you'd kind of be in the crossfire. Um, then I started to ex explore all these kind of archety archetypes of, of um, Western mythology and, and uh, Western film. Um, and a series of photographs. And, and I wanted to have, um, you know, oftentimes in the series, there would, there would be some kind of um, evidence of uh, the contemporary, such as um, the airplane here, or in other images, you would see um, tract housing or um, streets or street lamps, things like that, just to um, reinforce this, this notion of the um, West as, as um, just to dispel the kind of myth of the West and uh, to kind of cast these characters as uh, alienated and almost um, delusional as they kind of earnestly act out this history that never really existed. Um, and then as the, um, in the center of the exhibition was a life-size cabin made out of Lincoln logs. And I think this, in terms of how this relates to my later work, um, I've always had, um, I guess I've been drawn to doing uh, repetitive <laughs> tasks um, and, and time consuming ones. So I, I made um, this entire um, cabin out of Lincoln Logs and basically it was a video projection where um, it was a video of Monument Valley that looked like it was just a still image, but then um, every so often you would see kind of cars um, driving through the landscape. Um, I also created this sort of taxonomy of um, images of the West and I um, organized it into different categories and it was a big wall installation. Um, I printed on these very textured papers so, so that um, it kind of became even harder to distinguish what was real and what wasn't. So mixing actual landscape photographs that I took with stills from uh, Looney Tunes images of the West or um, images from um, film stills or or books or uh, images of actual places that, and then the end of the uh, project was or the, or kind of the um, epilogue was a series from um, that I took in Lone Pine, which is where 70% of Westerns were filmed. And, um, and basically the people will go out into the um, Alabama Hills, which are in, in Lone Pine and, um, and basically, they're they're instead of visiting the landscape, they're just visiting these sites where films were were made. So so um, people will dress up and um, and just almost reenact these places, such as the uh, what you're seeing on the right hand side. There are these little um, pieces of signage showing you which films were uh, filmed in in a particular location. And I was just sort of interested in how. Um, the, the kind of circle, circular thing that, that happened, whereas um, you know, the film films were kind of um, inspired by the landscape, but now the landscape is being totally informed and inspired by the film and, um, and, and kind of overtaking the, the landscape. It wasn't about this beautiful place, but it was about this particular rock where, where, where a um, certain film had, had been created. Um, and so then um, after that, I moved back to, um, to New York and I did a residency program with the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council um, and it was their residency in the Woolworth building. And uh, for this, um, all the students here, I just wanna encourage you to just take advantage of 
all of the studio programs that are in New York, I'm, I'm really grateful to them. And I'm not sure how easy it would have been to continue my artistic practice without that support. So there's a number of places like LMCC, Smack Mellon, the Q Arts Foundation, which will uh, give emerging artists studio space to work in um, for, for free. And it's a great way to also meet other artists and, and, um, and form a, a sense of community. And especially moving from California back to New York, it, it was really important to, to have that, that network. And so I encourage um, students who are here to, to look into that. And so um, I continue to, to be inspired by place and, and to try to uh, create work that related to place somehow. Um, at first, I, well, this was in um, the fall of 2002. And so um, I kind of started off creating these images with um, uh, these sort of uh, approaching storms in the background, um, these stage scenes. And then I started to think about the actual location itself where the residency was taking place. And the Woolworth building is known as the Cathedral of Commerce. And the inside of it looks like, um, looks literally like a Gothic cathedral, only the little statuary instead of being um, saints will be things like Woolworth holding um, nickels and dimes to, to um, refer to, um, to Woolworth or, um, or little, um, figures of, of architects with rulers, um, instead of uh, these kind of painted lunettes having saints in them, the, it actually is standing for um, commerce. And, and so I, I was interested in, in this sort of dual function of this building that looked so much like, uh, and borrowed so much from the, the um, architectural style of cathedrals, but in actuality was um, an office building. And, um, at the time, I, it, this was in 2002, and it was right around um, the time of, of Enron, and the Securities and Exchange Commission was also located in, in the Woolworth building. And so I decided to make this um, confessional out of a foam core where you could um, confess your, your um, uh, work-related transgressions. Um, and so I set it up in the lobby of, of the Woolworth building, and then um, it was a uh, foam core and it was all on hinges and very lightweight. So I could take it um, around in different parts of the city and I would set it up and you could um, confess and to confess, you had to write your confession on, on um, a dollar and, and pay a, a dollar. And, and so, um, and the confessions would, would range these, um, are, I didn't do anything today. I took four hours um, for lunch and I continued then um, also thinking about um, uh, other site specific projects and interactive ones. This is, uh, I was invited to participate in the Jamaica Center for Arts and, and Learning um, JFLUX uh, exhibition, which was a site specific exhibition. And, and so I, I looked into the history of, um, of Jamaica Queens and, um, and I think too, not only place, but thinking about history and how places have been informed by history is, is, is a thread that, that um, I've always been interested in and, and connects a lot of my work. Um, but uh, Jamaica, Queens comes from, um, the, the name Jamaica comes from um, it, uh, the word Jamaicos, which means a beaver place because it was really a very important place apparently in the fur trade. Um, so I made this um, trading post where people in the community could come and, um, and trade items. Uh, so they could bring something, but they had to um, give everything a tag and write a narrative about what it was that they were trading in. And so, um, for example, this is a, C a CD that um, the tag said something like, um, I made this uh, CD for a, a a girl I had a crush on. I had multiple opportunities um, that day to give it to her and never did. Um, and what was um, exciting to me about the project is that it actually was was really used. So people would um, really come and bring stuff and and um, take things. And, and so it um, became a very um, activated space. Um, so at, after that, I, um, I, uh, received a, a fellowship from the Society for Contemporary Photography in Kansas City, and um, which resulted in a solo show there. 
And I wanted to do something um, that kind of related to Kansas City. And, and Kansas City had, um, and, and it was very important in terms of, of railroads because of where it was located, all of these different um, railroad lines um, intersected there. So I decided I wanted to do a project of, about trains um, to kind of tie it to Kansas City. And actually this um, train station, which, now is sort of like it has restaurants and things like that. And it was actually just a couple of blocks from where the gallery was. Um, so I did a project where I decided to take a cross country train on the left. It kind of shows where I went. I went from San Francisco to New York and I made installations in the sleeper car of the train every day. And so I would put invitations out and people could um, come and, and uh, see the work. And um, which which now just lives in terms of, of photographic documentation. So each day on the train, I would do a, a different um, project. Um, so one of uh, them was filling the um, the train with a card house, um, putting decals on the windows. I um, hung these uh, circular mirrors on chains and and photographed the reflection of the. Um, of the light and the reflection of the outside as it um, kind of rushed by in the train window. I filled the sleeper car with um, balloons and I was just kind of interested in, in kind of act activating the space. And, and these images um, actually, even though this project is pretty old, it's from 2005, um, a couple of years ago, it was um, installed in the Metro system in Los Angeles. Um, as part of their photographic light box project. And um, as part of that exhibition also, I um, there were kind of a few um, projects centering around trains. I also was thinking about the idea of train tracks as kind of being connected and, and almost being like a continuous narrative, almost like a, the Bayou Tapestry or something, just one long story of all of these different like scenes and vignettes along different train tracks. Um, so I did a, a series of, um, images there. And then um, I did a sculptural piece that was um, called Sunrise and Sunset, which I basically cut holes in these thrift store paintings and, and this model train would kind of continuously go through um, and the paintings themselves went from um, morning to, to nighttime. And uh, I was in this piece, I was thinking about um, just the role of, of um, landscape painters historically, because they would often work for railroad companies to create these kind of um, propagandistic, um, beautiful images of the sort of untouched West um, to make people want to, to travel there and, and, um, and settle there. So um, shortly after that, I moved to California and the next few projects I created really kind of dealt with um, me adapting to Los Angeles. And, um, and I'll go through these uh, kind of quickly just for the sake of time. But um, the first thing I was, I was struck by in Los Angeles is just the celebrity culture, um, the idea of kind of voyeurism that comes from that and, and, and the connection between photography and voyeurism. And so I did a, a series of these um, self-portraits that look kind of like snapshots with um, different celebrity Im impersonators. Um, the first one is obviously Prince, this is Jack Nicholson. And, and I found the stories of the celebrity impersonators to be really interesting just in and of themselves. Um, so this person actually was an actor but couldn't get any jobs because he looked too much like Tom Cruise. So he just decided to be a celebrity impersonator. Um, there was a J-Lo um, impersonator that I photographed who um, basically wanted to have children, but she was waiting for the real JLo to get pregnant so that she could continue to impersonate JLo. So um, it was just really interesting to, to hear kind of their um, all of their stories. I'm just going to skip um, past that for um, just for the sake of time. But um, then I uh, also kind of re related to um, thinking about place. Um, I was just thinking about kind of the tenuous nature of um, of the built environment and the landscape in, in California, particularly in terms of um, earthquakes and, and um, that kind of delicate balance. And, and so I started um, creating these houses of cards. And this was also in, um, it kind of had a, a double meaning for me um, because it, this was in 2008 and nine. 
And it was around the time of the financial crisis and it just um, seemed uh, very on, um, ominous and everything kind of seemed like it was on the, the verge of collapse. And, and so I was thinking about um, the use of, of card houses as kind of a metaphor um, for that. Um, and then um, I did this project, which I think um, in some ways, even though visually it, it's not related at all, it, it has some connection, I think, to the work I've been doing around the Berlin Wall. Um, I was interested in, in the past of Los Angeles and, and Los Angeles is a place that um, where the past is almost um, erased. It's sort of built over. Um, there's not a, a sense of, of preservation in, in a lot of cases. And, and so I um, did a piece of, about a neighborhood um, called Bunker Hill, uh, which you're seeing um, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is what Bunker Hill looks like now. Um, but Bunker Hill was a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood that had these big, um, beautiful um, Victorian houses. And it was basically demolished to, to put in the, um, the financial and, and commercial area of downtown LA. Um, and so I uh, created um, this uh, souvenir penny machine of uh, just kind of showing that uh, where, where you could get a um, penny made of um, the old Bunker Hill. And I, I wanted it to appear as just a regular um, souvenir penny machine. And so you wouldn't really think anything of it, but then when you went closer to it, you would see that the images had nothing to do with the images of where you were, um, even though it, it's located here at Angel's um, Flight. So it was in the exact area of Bunker Hill, um, but I wanted people to, to kind of suddenly be aware of, of this history that, that had been erased or, or disappeared. Um, and these are just some examples of the pennies. And then um, the next, and this work is especially um, unrelated, but it really directly led to the embroidery work in, in some ways, and um, which I'll explain. But um, in 2008, I did um, something pretty dramatic for Los Angeles, and I got rid of my car. And um, and car, you know, car culture is what you think of primarily when you think of Los Angeles. Um, uh, Rainer um, Bannum said um, in um, thinking about Los Angeles, he wrote um, like earlier generations of English intellectuals who learned Italian to read Dante in the original, I learned to drive to read Los Angeles in the original. And um, and basically, um, you know, Los Angeles has the highest um, um, percentage of, of vehicle ownership in the country. And in fact, it's three times more likely that um, a household will have more than three cars than have zero cars. And so I got a grant from the California Council for the Humanities to photograph and interview 100 people who live in Los Angeles without a car. And, um, and over the course of, of the project, I met people from a wide range of, of backgrounds, um, socioeconomic levels, occupations, and I heard a huge range of reasons for not driving. So I, I met single moms, teachers, writers, consultants, comedians, actors, urban planners, computer programmers, analysts, bakery workers, students in the unemployed, um, people who didn't drive because of physical disabilities, people who didn't drive because um, they couldn't get a license for different reasons, um, people who were afraid of driving because they had been in accidents, uh, people who were not didn't have a car for financial reasons. And, um, and I collected um, just all of the, um, I would speak to everyone for about an hour and interview them and then um, collect their, their quotes. And I was interested just how um, car culture just uh, shaped the city um, and how just one's um, experience of the city and perception of the city changes when, when experienced from outside of the car. And on the one hand, I wanted to show the negative aspect of, of um, of transportation in, in Los Angeles and, and the, pro, the many real problems of it. Um, but to also show that that, um, that you can leave, lead a, a normal life even without a car. And it was very eye-opening for me. Um, so I um, found people in a wide number of, of ways. Um, uh, this was before Uber and Lyft. So this was a, um, 
a director who is a fairly well-known director, but would put ads in Craigslist looking for people to drive him places. And, and so I would um, answer ads on Craigslist trying to find subjects. Um, and I just tried to, to, um, to photograph as many um, people who are photographing for or who didn't have a car for for the widest uh, range of reasons possible but it was very eye-opening um some, uh this image is of undoc some undocumented workers and and um and things that i didn't even think about or realize um they told me that when they are um were picked up for a, a job that they would be driven somewhere to for a job but but then they wouldn't get a ride home so they would just be at some random work site that was 10, 15 miles away, and then they would have to walk home. Um, they didn't have smartphones, so they had to figure out how to, um, to get home without a GPS or anything like that. Um, and then also there were a lot of um, really awful things because they would be paid with cash. And so then I guess, um, people you know some people were aware of that situation and they would be mugged but because they were undocumented they didn't feel like they could um do anything about it so um some really um difficult situations i i talked to someone who was in a wheelchair because the, the and the sidewalks are very bad notoriously bad in los angeles and because of the uneven um sidewalks her, the, her wheelchair flipped and um and because no one so few people were walking she you know no one came to help her for like a half an hour or something. Um, so it was a really eye-opening project to me, for me. Um, and when my own decision, decision to get rid of a car, my car kind of came from moving to Los Angeles from Brooklyn and feeling when I got to LA that I, um, it was hard to really connect or feel part of the city because um, I would basically get into the car, go drive to a parking garage, get out of the parking garage, go into an elevator. And I didn't interact with people. It wasn't like New York where you're walking down the sidewalk and you um, interact with uh, you know, many people and, uh, and really feel like you're part of the city. And, and so um, I started um, biking and, and I, um, Got rid of my car and then I had gotten this grant um, so I, I continued doing the project and, and while the the issues um, that it brought up were really important to me I, I never really saw it as art I felt kind of disconnected to it um, also be, so I was more interested in it almost from a sociological perspective um, and an urbanism perspective than um, and, and didn't really see it as, as art. It was something that was really kind of different from my own artistic practice. But because, um, and it also was was all digital. I shot everything on film, but I scanned it and printed it. And, and this was kind of the first time I had um, really produced work that was completely digital. And so it made me feel very disconnected from it because I, I wasn't interacting with it. I wasn't touching it. I, it wasn't tactile. And so, um, and this project took a, a while big, um, just to uh, do all the photographs and, and especially to, um, to create the transcripts of, of the um, interviews. And so um, doing this project made me really want to do something tactile. And I think that's what led me then to want to um, begin the sewing work. And also as a precursor to the embroidery work, um, before I started photographing um, Los Angeles residents without a car, I, um, I was doing a project where I had hundreds and hundreds of these little um, squares of carpet remnant. I had a friend who, um, whose boyfriend was an interior designer and, and so he had all these carpet samples that he gave me. And I was making this big um, landscape that was basically these half inch tiles of different pieces of carpet. I can't find a documentation of, of the piece. It's probably on a, an old flip phone somewhere. But um, basically I, I was cutting these pieces of fabric into like these little um, quarter in, or half inch squares and creating this kind of like pixel like grid of this um, big um, landscape of, of Mont Blanc. And, um, I was really interested in just how the, the light hit the textiles 
um, and how this sort of um, pixely, uh, it looked like com computer pixels because it, it was these little squares. And I was interested in, in kind of the visual language of, um, of digital imaging while producing something that was totally analog. Um, so I was doing this work and, and, um, and it was really kind of an unpleasant process because when I would cut the carpet, all the glue and it's kind of like uh, attached to this rubbery kind of um, plasticky base, um, all of this um, dust would would be everywhere, and um, and it was pretty toxic. I discovered after after googling it, and so um, I ended up. I and then I I moved uh, studios, and and for a while I I moved all of these carpet remnants around with me, and eventually just um, got got rid of them, um, but. But it was always kind of in the back of my mind, and and I think even though not consciously, it was something that um, subconsciously, at least, um, probably in, informed the the embroidery work. And then I was also interested. Um, I found this um, painting in a, a thrift store in um, in Belgium, and and um, and I was I was really kind of captivated by it. It was just a kind of banal like studio portrait of these two young women and um, but the background had been totally painted over and so I became really interested also in this idea of of, um, of the photo as object and and um, and I started to uh, think about just um, uh, because of some um, just a, a event that, that happened in, in my family, I started to think about like what would happen if um, you know, all you had were, were photographs of and, and you had to construct a story of your life with, with photographs and thinking of the huge gap in distance between what um, family photo albums show because of these very highly curated spaces uh, versus the reality. And so, um, and I also started to think about how um, photographs ultimately become a substitution for memory and how you remember um, the photographs and um, and just how um, just the really porous nature of, of memory. And um, so I started uh, doing this um, embroidery pr um, process where um, I was create, uh, doing cross stitch embroidery that would resemble pixelization. And I was thinking about how um, the idea of uh, equating forgetting with file corruption and having um, a, a digital JPEG become more and more corrupted. And I also wanted to um, kind of cover the, the faces of, of the main character or the main figures. These are all my own family photos. Um, or, and it's kind of also mixed with, with landscapes. It kind of becomes a, a diary. Of, of, and, um, and so I, um, I was interested in just, um, yeah, think, thinking about um, by covering the kind of the, the main thing that you, you know normally in a photograph you would look at someone's face first, but by um, concealing that, I wanted it to to both be more universal so that you could feel more connected with it, but also kind of force you to look at the secondary details of the image as well and the things um, that might not be as remembered. Um, and so I was working on these and, and it's, this is sort of an, an ongoing um, pro project because it is kind of an archive in a way and, of, and a, a diary in, in a way. Um, so the, um, that it is a, a combination of, of travel snapshots and, and family photographs. And so I um, got a, um, I, was on sabbatical and I um, decided to do a residency in, in Berlin. And at the time I thought I was just going to work on the family photographs that um, a project that I had been working on, um, and which is uh, titled Time Spent That Might Otherwise Be Forgotten. But when I got to Berlin, I it was hard to, to stay inside and, and just so I really wanted to explore the city and I was really interested in Berlin as a city. And 
also really interested in, in, um, in the wall in particular. I was 13 when the wall fell and I remember watching it on television, but I didn't realize until I got to Berlin how huge it was. I didn't realize how much um, that it was a hundred miles long. I didn't realize that it was a ring that, that fully encompassed um, West Berlin and, and, um, and that West Berlin was, was sort of like a, an island in, in the middle of East Germany, basically. And I was interested in how the wall would really become part of your um, just visual culture every, every day. And, and then, um, and I became really fascinated in wanting to follow it. And there are a lot of, um, in the city center, there, there are some reminders of, of the wall and, and I think um, you really thoughtfully and intentionally left in place, just as a, a reminder to future generations um, not to, to repeat history. And so there are about um, three guard towers left in the city center, including this one, which is in the middle of, of the park. Um, and I started to, I realized that the embroidery process that I had been using and the time spent that might otherwise be forgotten project also really lent itself to, um, to ideas of, of collective memory in Berlin. And, and I was thinking about the wall as kind of the scar in the landscape that even though you might not see it anymore, um, still felt very present. And so um, I started stitching the wall back in place and um, in uh, basically the, the kind of size and scale that, that it would have been. And, um, and the sizes from the series sort of uh, vary based on how much detail I wanted there to be. So this is one of the larger pieces. And I wanted this, uh, the, the kind of scale of the stitching is always the same, um, just because that it's sort of the, uh, the size where it, it, the paper will um, hold up and, um, and it looks the most square-like. Square so it's, um, I kind of keep the resolution of, of the stitches the same. And so the size of the images change based on, on how much detail I wanted. And, and so in this one, I wanted uh, you to be able to see the tourists taking selfies and the bicycles and almost as if they're kind of trapped in the, in the wall. And um, I was really thinking of, of the wall as kind of this um, trace in the landscape and almost a ghost of, of something that even if it wasn't there still psychologically was, was very present. And, and um, this is one of the um, smaller pieces where the, the wall is, is more abstract. And uh, this is just a, a map so you can see how uh, big the wall was and, and how it was this, um, an actual ring. And also what I didn't realize is how much of it is in the suburbs. So, um, you know, this here is really kind of the, the city center of Berlin, but that's maybe, you know, 10% or 15% of the wall and the rest is all in the suburbs and the forests. And, um, and so I really wanted to kind of follow the, the wall and see where it left. And in some places, um, like the guard tower sections remain. So this is a, a piece uh, in Mauer Park that still exists and all the different colors that you're seeing are, are a pixelated view of the graffiti that would have been on the wall. And um, this is just the, the back of, of what one of the images look, looks like. I was kind of also interested in just how the back becomes almost a, a map of its own in a way. And um, this, uh, interspersed there are some also some locations that um, relate to just the history of that time, um, even if they're not on the actual wall itself. So this is uh, an office in the, uh, a plant that was in the office of the state secret police. I was interested in, in um, the idea of um, kind of the double meaning of, of the word plant um, also, and, and just um, uh, someone, um, uh, Magnus Apolker, who, who wrote about my work for Lens Culture, talked about um, how kind of equated uh, the use of uh, the embroidery and pixelization to, to the um, high levels of, of security and use of security cameras at the time um, by the, the Stasi. And, um, and uh, I photographed um, places like um, Checkpoint Charlie would which has this kind of like strange um, simulation and is now really kind of this um, tourist uh, attraction. Um, 
this is a, a guard tower that is in the courtyard of kind of a, a upscale um, a condo. Uh, and you can't really tell from, from the courtyard view, but um, on the other side, it kind of, the facades face a canal and they're, they're kind of a fancy, but, but this guard tower has been left um, in, in the courtyard of the building. And I was especially interested in, as I followed the wall out into the suburbs, of um, thinking about uh, places where when it, if it, even if it didn't exist, where you could still see some, um, some clues of, of its former existence. And so that might include um, you know, the trees being a, a different size or the architecture um, suddenly changing um, because of the, the built up space that, that suddenly e existed. This is um, a Spree Park, which is an abandoned uh, DDR amusement park. And, um, and it, again, the, um, the uh, embroidery is, is um, you're meant to also kind of uh, block the viewer from, from the surface of the print. I tried to think about um, the vantage point of the image and where your eye would want to go and um, have the embroidery be in that area so that uh, you would literally kind of be blocked from entering the image and, and for there to be this kind of um, dimensionality and, and playing around also with the kind of um, the kind of soft and domestic kind of associations of the embroidery with with um, kind of the the harsh and, and cold um, materiality of, of the wall and and um, and so the, this is a church that um, where the wall was uh, built right in front of the church. Um, the other side was water, and so it literally cut the church completely off. Um, the campanile of this church was actually um, turned part of uh, became part of the wall itself. And this is Glen and Cape Bridge. Um, I also was kind of interested in, in thinking about how um, I could embroider the image so that um, like what the least amount of photographic information I could um, could maintain would be. So I started to think about um, what if there was only small sections of, of the building um, that you could actually see. This is um, an area in the uh, in the forest and, and the forest had, um, in, instead of having the, the kind of traditional concrete wall that you think of when you think of the, um, of the Berlin Wall, um, there, there would be kind of barbed wire and things like that in, in the forests. And, and it was also striking to me how um, people would be so cut off from, from nature. So you, um, the, a lot of the forests and lakes, um, you would be um, prevented from, from visiting because of, of the wall. Um, this is uh, just a, um, a residential area, um, but I was kind of struck by how this um, tree house it looks so much like, like a guard tower and this, um, say, a home along the wall. This is a, um, a neighborhood where um, there is the, this uh, and it, what the wall did run right on this spot, and there's this fragment of it just kind of randomly in this backyard, and um, which I guess the um, owners decided to to keep. And um, but I was um, you know, kind of in interested in, in thinking about the em embroidery and and. Um, you know, again, is this way of, of um, thinking uh, about memory and, and um, just uh, kind of having it seem like a, sc a screen almost where you, you, it was kind of floating on the surface of the print and you could, but you could kind of um, see through it and see the landscape behind it so, so that it was kind of present and not present at the same time, um, which is how the, the wall itself felt. This is, this is a um, cemetery that literally was cut in half um, by the wall. And this is a, a guard tower out in the 
suburbs that um, had been turned into a nature preserve. And then um, most recently I've been working on, on a series of um, embroidered images of uh, class photographs. And in this work, I, I was thinking of, I've been interested in kind of this idea of, of um, of class photographs and, and the way, the sort of um, uniformity of them. Like I, I've been collecting class photos from not only the US, but other places uh, in the world, um, rural areas, urban areas, suburban areas. And in all of them, everyone is always sitting in the same exact way in the same poses. And, and I actually even wondered if there was a, a guidebook for 1970s uh, school portrait photographers somewhere um, and there wasn't. So, so it, at least not one that I can find. And so it, it um, made me curious and interested in, in these sort of, this idea of these sort of like aspirational um, portraits and ways of, of represent self-representation and, and, um, and kind of trying to trace the, the lineage of it. And, and this is a project I've kind of at the very, very early stages of, but um, I'm doing some research into just um, portraiture in terms of the history of portrait painting and also um, daguerreotypes to um, kind of see like where uh, all of the, these, because it's so um, widespread and uniform in so many places, like where um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the format of them uh, have kind of come from. And, and I was interested in this time, not only because um, it's my own generation, but it's the last generation to grow up without digital cameras and digital imaging when getting your class picture taken was, was more of, a, um, of, an, of an event, more of a more formal occasion. And, um, and so I've just kind of um, barely started um, this project, but I look forward to, um, to continuing it this summer. And, and, um, and that is uh, basically everything that I have. And um, I'm happy to, uh, if anyone has any uh, questions or anything like that, I'm happy to answer them. Diane, thank you so much. That was such a brilliant presentation. And I think it was really good to see um, the breadth of your work. And whilst I agree that your earlier work was really quite different, one can also see those threads that really makes your current work actually make sense. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I think one of the things that I wanted to ask you is that um, with your earlier work, there was uh, certainly a good level of performance, um, certainly directly from you. And then also you have a good level of performance from the audience as well, especially um, in projects like the Trading Post and the, the minting of the penny. Um, and I'm just wondering whether the, um, if you view the embroidery that you do in your current work as a continuation of that performance. Um, that's, that's an interesting um, uh, point in terms of, um, I guess I don't really think of it. I haven't really thought of it that way, at least not on a conscious level, um, because the, that aspect does seem like kind of a, a departure. And, and one, one thing that has been um, with the embroidery, I do the pieces in, um, they're in an edition of three with two artist proofs. And so there's basically five copies of each of them that are made. And, and so, um, that has kept me very busy. This is definitely the longest that I've ever worked on <laughs> on a single um, project. And, and that was something too, I was kind of interested in, in terms of the aspect of time that the photograph has taken in the fraction, a fraction of a second. And then the embroidery is this very long kind of meditative process that is um, longer than the actual construction of, of the wall, the, the embroidery of it, 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 it takes longer than it actually um, took to, to build. Um, the wall, but I, I didn't, I haven't really thought of it as a performative, um, uh, the performative nature of it. Well, it's interesting because one of the interesting things you speak about with your work is how the, um, through the embroidery, you're pixelating that portion of the image and therefore you're partially obscuring the image um, and making it hard for the viewer to, to see the 
photograph as a whole yeah and kind of relating that to memory and how parts of our memory disappear and fall away and then we have these snippets of details that we maybe we can't even quite see or remember um and i wonder how you feel the audience should um i guess participate in the work in relation to that, because I know that you have a very different viewing experience when you look at your artwork from afar. And then mm -hmm. when you come in very close as a viewer, uh, you, you have a very different experience. And it's almost like um, the embroidery is like a, that screen you might have in your, you know, your year round veranda, where you can kind of change the focus of your eye and you can kind of see through and other times you just see the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was um, interested in that idea of having the, I mean, when, when you're looking at the embroidered piece, it's kind of an intimate experience because you need to be fairly close to it, but that, um, but it does kind of shift when you see it from afar, you, it looks like maybe a normal photograph. And then as you get closer and, and closer, you kind of see the, the pixelization. And, and so it was, um, I mean, I, I think in terms of having um, an, the, a viewer interact with it. I mean, I, I am really interested in the, the idea of the, the photograph as being um, an actual object and, and the, uh, the way that, um, that the, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, marks that are, there's an anthropologist, Elizabeth Edwards, who kind of talks about the physicality of the photograph and how all of the marks and creases and tears kind of become part of the image. And, and so I was, thinking about that in, in terms of just even the puncturing of, of the paper and putting holes in it. And, and I guess um, in terms of, of the uh, audience, I wanted it to be kind of a, almost in some ways like a slightly frustrating thing in the sense that as you get close, you're kind of blocked from seeing the focal point of the image. I try to, to often put the embroidery in, in the kind of focal point where your eye would normally want to go and, and then have you be blocked. And, yeah, and that's really interesting because that's almost like a reversal of what normally happens with photography when it's um, on view because we see it from afar and we go in closer to see the detail. But in your case, um, you're actually standing back to see the whole picture and then coming in close to see um, the labour of the hand, as it were. And um, I just wonder whether you might say something about um, the part of the planning that you do with pixelating the image through the embroidery and it's interesting because uh even though even though it's the cross stitching that pixelates the image as during part of your talk you actually spoke about the resolution of the of the stitches which i thought was really interesting so it's mm -hmm. almost like within your own mind the embroidery has become part of this pixelation in a kind of or almost organically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, um, in terms of, play, one thing that that was kind of um, interesting is even in shooting it, so I shot everything on film and, and I initially mm. went to Berlin for an artist residency in January and February, and uh, which is not, not the most ideal time to go if you're planning a trip. I, I thought it would be sort of like New York, but it turns out that it's actually uh, much further north. So it basically would, the sun would rise at nine and set at three basically when I first got there. But at least there would be sort of this like late afternoon light all the time because the sun never got very high in, in the sky. But, um, but anyway, I went in the winter and I wanted to go back um, because I didn't want just to kind of change the uh, color palette of the series so it wasn't all just like gray and 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 um, brown and, and white from the snow. So I wanted to include um, images from the springtime as well. But it but it became interesting in terms of planning the embroidery because I there were some images that I shot the first time, and I composed them in a way that I would that I thought was you know formally the the strongest that I would normally you know try to to frame a photograph but then I realized that with the stitching that then it totally changed it and so then I had to kind of think about composing the images with the fact that the stitching would would be in place um so so that became a, a really kind of different way of, of kind of um thinking about it beforehand and then um and then in terms of the um 
the resolution and, and thinking about it as, as part of the piece, I guess, um, you know, I'm always, as I'm thinking about the image, I'm thinking about where the wall was and, and it, trying to line it up with, with kind of the, the focal point and, and then also thinking about how much detail I would want to be in a particular area. Um, but and is, and the, did I, is, yeah, is absolutely. <laughs> and I, and I, think, I think as well, uh, before I go to the questions from the audience, and thank you, everyone, we have some really great questions coming up. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could just share with folks actually how many stitches you put into the work, because, for example, I know the Brandenburg Gate is your largest piece and it, and it took six months to make. How many stitches in that photograph? 17,000. <laughs> well, that's a lot. Yeah. And um, I think that even with your smaller pieces, you have on average more than a thousand stitches. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I figured out I can do 80 stitches an hour. And so um, <laughs> I can, especially if I have a deadline, I can kind of uh, figure out exactly how much I need to do on a particular day. Right. Um, but it is it is a long process. I tend to work on multiple pieces at once. I think maybe so I don't have an existential crisis about how much time. <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine. Um, but um. I, I, get to, I, I try to um, just, or I try to make myself feel better about the time um, because it's the only time I allow myself to watch um, television or Netflix is when I'm sewing. So right. I, I feel, <laughs> at least if I'm sewing for like four or five hours a day, some people are just watching TV for four or five hours a day. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it's a long, um, a long, a, a pretty long process. It's getting faster, but um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, just move to some questions from the audience and I have a question here from Richard Tushman and he says, what was your original inspiration for incorporating embroidery in your work? Did you have prior experience with the craft of embroidery and can you talk about the advantages and the challenges of the process? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I always um, I always liked sewing. So when I was little, my, my mother taught me how, how to sew and, and she would let me, when I was a child, she would let me stay up late on Friday night and watch Dallas with her if I was like, and we would sew and, and watch TV together. And so um, it was something I've, I've always liked doing. And, and even, I didn't show any of it, but even in looking through my older work, there are there are a lot of um, times when I did kind of um, go back, or I, I did sort of incorporate embroidery into my work, but I always saw it, saw it sort of separately. I think um, I think maybe it, and I don't feel this way now, but at the time I think I saw the sewing more as maybe craft or or something, or I just thought it as something that was separate, um, yeah, which which is not how I feel now. I, I feel like um, uh, you know, craft. I, I feel like craft is, is a really important part of, of, the, of fine art, but at the time I always did see it as something different, but there are a lot of ways in which it kind of showed up in my work. So um, when I was in graduate school and I did the project about Westerns, I, I made a 16 millimeter Western film and all of this, the inner titles were all embroidered. And um, I curated a a show in the in a project space um, that was um, sewn work, but it was just like these little projects that, that people had. Yeah, so it sounds like you had the there's this element of embroidery throughout your practice. Um, so, and then in terms of the embroidery, what would you say would be the challenges of working with that? Um, I mean, I think I mean just the time is probably the the biggest and the potential existential crisis yeah <laughs> I mean it, it is also I mean it it is kind of like a meditative kind of you know so it, it is um I mean I, I enjoy doing it even though it's kind of like slow and repetitious and um which uh but I um I do really like working with my hands and, and I think even in, in the earlier work I was doing kind of a lot of kind of sculptural installation work and and so it's and and I think that's why I had such a hard time when I was doing the Carlos project was because I just there's no tactility at, at all and and um so I, I think you know really that the time is the most um difficult part um sometimes 
uh, just organizing all the, the thread. Um, the now I have a separate studio space that is not in um, my living space, but it used to be um, keeping my cat out of the Wow. Right. <laughs> that's very challenging so it's interesting someone we have in the audience is an and also a UCSD alum um, this is Jeff Scott hi Jeff who has a question which is um, relating to the Berlin project and he's asking whether um, having made the Berlin series whether you have any curiosity about the border wall with Mexico at all um, I guess yeah. from an artist's perspective I thought, um, yeah, I mean, not um, directly, even though I'm in Los Angeles and, and it's it's very close. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I think with the, Ber I mean, part of the Berlin work was not me um, intending to even do that when I when I went to Berlin, but it was um, it was just like I my own actual reaction to, to being there and seeing the immensity of the wall. I didn't realize how severe it was and um, and really wanting to use it as a, as a way to explore. And I think, um, yeah, if you, I've been asked about that before. And I think that um, it's, um, I mean, I, I think, I'm, because I'm more interested really in kind of memory than than borders necessarily and 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 the idea of, of just the you know really again kind of thinking about it as this ghost in the landscape and 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 this idea of something being um present and still felt in, in its absence is is what is the most interesting part to me and and so more so than than actual border and, and I feel like um I would want to do something i'd worry too that that maybe exploring other borders would would be maybe repetitive or or um or something yeah and and i remember when we've spoken many years ago and you spoke about that experience of going to berlin and you did the residency and you weren't quite sure what you were going to do when you were there and it's almost yeah. like the city itself gave you that project um through yeah. your experience of you know basically discovering the wall for yourself for the first time yeah. um, and I think that um, I, uh, there we do have another question as well which kind of comes back to some technical issues I hope you don't mind mm -hmm. I do know that there's a um, it's interesting how you work with the pixelation of the images and I know you spend a lot of time planning out that level of pixelation in your work and so we actually do have a question from Tom Ash I'm the chair mm -hmm. of MPS Digital mm -hmm. Photography. Thank you, Tom. And he's he's actually asking a really curious question, which I think a lot of people um, ask. And certainly when I've exhibited your work, we get the question, which is, how is it that you actually match so well the colors of the images with the threads that you use for the embroidery? The, and I am, um... I uh, I do like make a pixel. I do pixelate in Photoshop to see kind of averages of, of squares, which it's never actually um, totally accurate. So it's like kind of a base level guide, and then I I have to um, change it usually. But um, and it and that I think initially was the slowest process because I would pick up all of these different threads and like have to hold them up to the to the photograph and see if that was exactly the right color. And um, and then, but now because I've been doing it for so long, I can sort of see a, so I have on my embroidery thread in um, with, the, it's they're all numbered. And so I can look at a color and, and I know what number it is. I can kind of see the, the number. So it's, I've gotten, um, and that has made the process much, much faster, but, um, but so yeah. you're kind of like that guy in the matrix who doesn't see what the matrix is building, but he just sees the code. Now you see the numbered colors. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to move on to another um, question. Um, oh, it's actually just some folks saying thank you very much. They think that um, uh, your work is great. 
and appreciate you sharing it. I kind of do have um, another question for you relating, kind of moving on to the newest project, which is the class pictures of the children in the 1970s. Um, it's interesting how the work very clearly relates to memory and that relationship with photography is also well known. Um, but I wonder whether um, you've thought about how the, uh, the covering of the faces, um, there's kind of like a relationship between the way you cover the faces of the children with your previous comment about the secret police and the secret cameras and how your squared areas of embroidery kind of um, was almost like a metaphor for that. Um, and now um, I wonder whether you're thinking about how your pixelation might relate to something like um, facial recognition software um, within the, that digital sphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I mean, I wanted also um, for the images to be a little bit unsettling and I feel like um, you, you, know, you see um, pixelated faces often, especially with minors in, in news stories or, or something like that. And, and so, um, I mean, the, the main conceptual reason I am doing it is, is um, because I was really interested in how people are posing and, and the body language and how it's um, so uniform across all of these different places and, um, and thinking about where that, um, those, those impulses are and, and thinking about to this idea of kind of um, uh, self-representation or, or, or at least, I mean, the parents are idea of, of what, what they want to represent in terms of dressing everyone up for, for picture day. And, and so um, it was really more in wanting, I feel like when you see a portrait of a person, you look at their face and their eyes immediately. And I didn't want people to get kind of caught in that. I wanted you to notice um, especially when you see several of them as a series, the, just the similarities, but also the, um, the body language, the differences in terms of, of gender, in terms of how um, the children are, are sitting, um, the, and to kind of look at the, um, the clothing and things like that. So, um, so, the, so the, the main thing is that, but, it, but I do, can, I am interested in, in the kind of um, connections, the, the visual connections it has with other things like facial recognition, like um, news images, and, and yeah. um, you know, and, and for them to be maybe a little unsettling. Yeah, and it's it's interesting as well because uh, you've spoken about your work being about exploring uh, places and how places are informed by history, and I guess our um, our journey through those spaces as well. And I wonder if you can maybe talk about that in relation to the class photographs, because you're photographing um, certainly in the 1970s, which you've identified as being kind of that, that last bastion of um, non-digital class photograph. And also it's, it's when you were passing through school at that time. Um, do you still feel that that work as well is uh, kind of exploring maybe not necessarily a physical place, but some other kind of place? Yeah, I mean, de definitely um, a time period. It, it, um, I mean, not only were, I mean, now with digital imaging, it, it's, um, you know, my mom probably had one roll of film in her camera for the entire year and would take like <laughs> one picture on like a holiday or something. And so now people take hundreds and hundreds of pictures a, a day and, and then you lose them all because they're don't, you know, they're not labeled property and your properly and your hard drive dies. And so it's almost like even though there are so many more pictures than before that they're, you they're uh, almost all lost or you don't look at them. And, and so I, I was interested um, thinking about this, this time period of, of um, the photograph kind of being more precious in a way. Um, but, um, and, and also the having it be a more kind of formal event, but, but, um, the, but yeah, definitely, definitely like thinking about it historically in terms of just the, the time period and this, this, um, time before we've been so transformed by digital imaging. And, and I'm really, um, thankful, honestly, that, that there wasn't social media or email or any of those things when, when I was in, in high school. And, and so it's, um, 
you know, it, it, it's sort of this, this last time that, that it's like that last generation to grow up that way. Yeah. And it's interesting as well with your work there. It's been, it's, it's a very, your artwork itself is a very interesting journey that you have made as well. So you're talking about how your work deals with places, but this idea of journey, I think is very prevalent as well, especially when we think about um, the train journey and you showed us that map of the, the, the place you traveled. Um, and then you showed us the map of the Berlin Wall. And it's almost like we have this map through the class photographs of, um, you know, this idea of uh, learning cultural norms through posing um, and uh, uh, this uh, documentation of a particular point in our educational life. Um, so I, and the other interesting thing is when you showed us the back of one of the embroidered pieces and showing all the knotted threads, you kind of spoke about that in terms of being your journey of making. Um, so I'm just wondering whether, as well as memory, whether this idea, this notion of journeys is, is something that you think about at all, or maybe if that's just kind of organically arisen in the work? The, yeah, I think, um... I mean, it, I think it's kind of probably just um, arisen in a, in a way, but I feel like all all photography kind of becomes a, a journey in, in a way because you're always kind of going out and finding the unexpected and, mm -hmm. and there's always kind of a level of, of chance and searching. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Diane. I don't think we have any more questions at this point. So I just want to say thank you so much it's been a really invigorating talk and I'm sure everyone, um, based on the comments we're getting, which is a lot of thank yous, I think everyone has um, really enjoyed the presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much again for inviting me and, and thank you everyone for, for listening.